Hey, I'm Mark Romanek for Precision Trolling Data. We're on location today in northern Michigan testing crankbaits for the Precision Trolling app. If you've ever wondered how deep your favorite fishing lures go, stick around because we're going to show you today exactly how deep they go and how you can be a better and more successful fisherman. Stick around. Fishing 411 is brought to you by Offshore Tackle, your leader in trolling technology. Fishing 411 is brought to you by Offshore Tackle, your leader in trolling technology. Jay's Sporting Goods, trust in the tradition. Yakima Bait, home of the rooster tail. Cisco Fishing Systems, fish the finest. Northwest Ontario Tourism Association, there's no place like this. Starcraft Marine, America's oldest aluminum fishing boat line. Evan Rood Outboards, introducing the all new Evan Rood E Tech G2, the outboard of the future, available today. Maxima Fishing Lines, the right line every time. Also, these fine sponsors. Well, we're here today with Morris Langworthy, who has done our dive curve testing, the actual scuba portion in the water for the better part of about 10 years. Yes. It's been a good 10 years. It has. And uh, we've toyed with different methods of collecting the data for precision trolling, but we've always come back to scuba diving. And the reason we've come back to scuba diving is it's the only method that we've found where you can consistently control all the variables and where you can actually get a fish's eye view, if you'll excuse the pun, yep. of exactly what these lures are doing under the surface so we can confirm not only depth, but also their action to make sure that they're running correctly. And without a guy like Morris, we're dead in the water. We just simply can't do this effectively. We're there to observe and verify all of the conditions that he's setting up to ensure that the data you're receiving is accurate. And that's what it all boils down to is there's a bunch of variables associated with trolling. We're going to control these variables very closely today so that we can produce data that you can replicate and duplicate on the water. It's going to make you a better fisherman and it's going to make you a more successful troller. Okay, it's time to get started with our first data point. And what we do is we let our crankbait out behind the boat and we start with a short lead length and we collect that piece of data by trolling that lead length past the diver. And then after we've accomplished that, then we do it again uh, with a different lead length and we do it again with a different lead length and another and another and another. And eventually what we've done is we've collected a whole bunch of data points and then we simply take those data points and we plot them onto an XY graph, and that's how our proprietary precision trolling dive curve was born. Um, that dive curve allows you to see what depth that lure is gonna run, regardless of what lead length that you would use. And we're using lead lengths literally from zero all the way out to about 200 feet. So all the appropriate lead lengths the troller would use, we're gonna cover all of that information. Now I've just gone past the diver, and what I'm doing is I'm trying to run this lure as close to the diver as I physically can get it to him without actually catching the diver. There's some skill associated with this because it's a pretty fine line. We're talking about putting a crankbait within 10 inches to a foot from the scuba diver himself. Here he comes. 11 foot, 10 inches, very good, all right. You know, part of the purpose of this video is to try to answer folks' questions about trolling and how we collect the data and how accurate the data is and how useful it is. The most common question I get when I'm doing trolling seminars is people want to know. They can see that we're trolling right past the diver. <clears throat> they want to know if we ever hooked the diver. And in fact, yes, I hooked the diver quite honestly, commonly. When you think about it, the fact that that lure is just inches away from the diver, you can understand how easy it is to hook the diver. It took me a few years before I quit setting the hook. Oh, ho, ho, ho. that is a beautiful walleye. I'll take that as a consolation prize any day. Spectacular walleye. Anybody would be happy to catch a walleye like that. 
You're gonna catch him out in the middle of nowhere, suspended down 20 feet, down over 40 to 45 feet of water. Who'd have thunk? Who'd go looking for him there? Toad. There are two primary variables that are gonna control how deep a crankbait is gonna run below the surface. The number one variable is lead length. In other words, how far back behind the boat you put it. In general, the further you put a lure behind the boat, the deeper it's gonna dive. The second variable is line diameter. And diameter plays to friction. The thinner a line is, the less friction it has in the water and the deeper those lures naturally can dive. So when we're doing our testing, we test on actually two different types of lines. We test on monofilament, normally something about 13 thousandths or about 10 pound test in diameter. And then we also test on a braided line, 10-4 fire line, uh, which is a braided type material or a fuse type line. Um, and you'll see that our dive curves, the fuse line or the braided lines tend to run deeper than the monofilament. That's simply because they're thinner in diameter and they have less friction in the water. But those are the two most important variables, lead length back and line diameter. If you control those two variables, you can very accurately steer your crankbaits or what we call, it's like putting sights on them, you can aim your lures right to the fish you're trying to target. Additional considerations provided by Argo Amphibious ATV, Extreme Terrain Vehicle Solutions. Additional considerations provided by Ontario's Algoma Country, That Real. All right. You know, the process of collecting this data is, uh, let me write this number down before I forget it, is methodical. We basically do the same thing over and over and over again. In fact, it's so methodical, it's somewhat boring. But in the end, the data we collect is invaluable to the fishermen because it tells them exactly what they need to know. They can take a lure, uh, use any lead length that they need to use to get it to run exactly the depth they want. And once they have a lure that's working and a depth that's working, they can glean that data from other lures and say, okay, if this lure goes this depth and is working, I wonder if another lure might work better. And that's what precision trolling is all about, is knowing where your lures are doing and targeting those fish at specific depths. It's deadly. And over 20 years ago, when we first started testing crankbaits uh, to create our first book, uh, the Precision Trolling Book, which has kind of affectionately been known as the Troller's Bible, we had some preconceived notions of what we want to try to accomplish. But what we discovered really early on in our testing is that some of the things that we thought were going to be true about trolling did not turn out to be that way. The variables are doing different things than you might imagine. Like for example, right now I've got 200 foot of monofilament out behind the boat. That's a very long lead length. And most people would think that line's angling right directly down to the lure. <clears throat> Actually, that's not happening at all. What's happening is 80 to 90% of that line is floating on the surface. Monofilament is buoyant. Only the last few feet of the lead length actually dives down in the water to where the lure is running in the water. It creates an inverse curve. And so when a fish bites that lure, for him to get hooked, that bow in the line or that curve in the line has to be pulled taut before you know, the fish actually feels any resistance or the hook point actually gets to his mouth. And so that's one of the things that we didn't understand about trolling. And that explains why we often get bites while we're trolling but don't necessarily hook those fish is because that fish has to hang onto the lure long enough to be able to pull tight. And it's several seconds before that happens. And so what's the wisdom here? Sharp hooks. When you're trolling, your hooks need to be razor sharp so that when a fish touches that lure, he can't open his mouth and spit it back out. Sticky sharp is the way to catch fish on crankbaits. You're starting to see marks on the graph that we're in that target zone we're looking for. And uh, it was just simply a matter of getting our baits down there. Looking like another nice walleye. It is indeed a nice walleye. All right, let's see if we can get him in here close enough. Getting in there. All right, that's what I'm talking about. Man, that is a nice walleye. Come right out of the net there for me, just as clean. You know, we talked about how speed doesn't really influence how deep a floating crankbait runs below the surface. But there are other variables that do influence it. For example, you notice today how it's flat calm out here. These are the days we choose to test on because, because wave action really does make a difference in how deep these lures dive. What happens on a rough day, a wavy day, as you can imagine, our dive buoy is going up and down in the water like this. If it's a one foot sea, that tape measure we use to measure with is going up and down in the water one foot. And uh, that's unacceptable for us. We're trying to measure to the inch here, so we try to test on flat, calm water. 
The other thing that waves do is that when you're going with the waves, your lures actually dive deeper. When you're going against the waves, your lures dive shallower because the friction of the water moving in one direction, hence the wave action, actually pushes that lure back up to the surface. How big of a difference is it? It can make a pretty substantial difference. On average crankbait with a 200 foot lead, if that crankbait is normally running 15 foot on flat weather, if you're running into a facing sea, or in other words, trolling into the seas, you're gonna lose one to two foot of depth off that lure just because of the friction of the wave action. So waves do make a difference in terms of how deep a crankbait will run. Additional considerations provided by Lawrence Electronics. Find, navigate, dominate. Fishing 411 is also brought to you by Okuma, high performance, and Mustang Survival. We save lives for a living. We just completed the amount of data points that I'm looking for on monofilament here. So what I'm gonna do is reel this lure in and switch it over to the other line type that we're gonna test. We've tested on all kinds of lines. We've tested on monofilament, fused, braided. Uh, we've even used wire line to do some of our testing. So we can test on virtually any kind of fishing line a person would wanna use. We've even done things like copper line and lead core. All of that can be tested with precision trolling. And what I'm doing when I switch lines is I'm just changing one of the variables. And we, like we try to do our best to control these variables as much as we possibly can. And so by using a thinner line, I know there'll be less friction on the line. I expect these numbers that we collect to be deeper than the monofilament numbers for the same lure. And as I write them down in my chart, I'll be able to see exactly what's going on here. If for any reason these numbers don't make sense, then I can tell that there's something wrong. There's a variable that is not being paid close attention to. Either I've messed up what I'm doing, the lure's not tuned, Sometimes we snag something on the lure, like a little piece of weed or something while we're trolling. But I know the second I bring that data up, whether it's good data or bad data, and that's how we stay on top of this. And that's the other reason why we're using the scuba diver, is because if this lure comes by him and it's got a little piece of weed trailing on it, he sees it and he knows immediately there's a flaw in what we're trying to accomplish and we can correct that flaw immediately. If you're not doing that kind of you know, due diligence, you're not gonna end up with good data. You know, the other misnomer about trolling is that most anglers believe that trolling speed has a dramatic influence on how deep their lures are going. And the answer to that could be yes, but often the answer to that is no. Depends on what you're trolling. If you're doing a crankbait, something that floats at rest and then dives when you troll it, speed is not gonna influence the depth of that lure. If I was trolling one miles an hour, all the way out to about four miles an hour with a floating crankbait, I would see no difference in how deep the lure would go based on speed. The reason for that is that as friction is impacting on the lure, as you speed up, it's pushing on the lip harder and it's trying to make that lip, you know, trying to push that lure down deeper in the water. You can feel that because the bait starts working harder. But at the same time that that lure is trying to achieve more depth and work harder, there's more friction on the line as you speed up. And the two forces counteract one another. So what ends up happening when you speed up is you don't necessarily change the depth of your lure at all. Now, that's with a floating diving device. If I was using something that sinks, like a keel sinker or a tadpole diver or any number of other sinking devices, that's where speed is important. And we pay very close attention to speed when we're testing things that sink. But when we're testing things that float, we try to just create an average speed, somewhere around two to 2.5 miles an hour. And that's where we test everything because it's right in the middle of the curve and speed doesn't matter when you're talking about a floating device. Let's talk about lure tuning. Most people think when you buy a crankbait like this and you take it out and you fish it, all you have to do is tie down your line and it's going to just dive in the water perfectly and catch fish every time. <laughs> it don't happen like that. Actually, these are mechanical devices and because they're mechanical devices, no two of them are exactly the same they don't always come in the package tuned. And what do I mean by tuned? What I mean is a tuned lure, it should dive straight down in the water. Rarely does that happen with crankbaits. Normally what happens with a crankbait is it tends to favor to the left or it tends to favor to the right of center. Now why is that bad? Well, first off, you don't get the natural action out of the lure. Secondly, you won't get anywhere near the natural depth the lure is capable of achieving. So if you really want to catch a lot of fish on crankbaits, you have to hand tune them to get them to dive straight down in the water. Stick around, I'll tell you how to do that. The way to do the crankbait is to cast the lure out in calm water. Point the rod right at the lure, put your rod tip down towards the, the water surface, and reel. 
And what I can see what's happening with this one is I reel fairly fast, the lure is going out a little bit to the right. So what I have to do to adapt to that is take a pair of needle nose pliers and I simply put the lure facing me. Since the lure is running to the right, I want to bend the eye tie attachment just a little bit the opposite direction, or in this case, to the left. Now we got it. There you have it, a tuned crankbait. So if you can't tune your crankbaits while you're trolling, how should you tune them? What I recommend you do is just kill the boat, just put it in neutral, and just drift. Cast straight downwind, point your rod tip straight at the lure, put your rod tip down to the water level, and reel as fast as you can reel. What you're doing is you're bringing that lure straight back to the boat. And by reeling fast, you're going to personify any imperfections in the tune. If the bait is just slightly out of tune to the left, it's going to go left of center. If it's just slightly out of tune to the right, it's going to go right of center. So how do you make the adjustments to that? That's where we go back to our little needle nose pliers. The eye tie attachment that's molded into the lip of the bait, if the bait goes left, you bend the eye tie attachment slightly to the right. If the bait goes right, you bend it slightly to the left. This is a trial and error process. I've tuned thousands of crankbaits in my life, and it's never easy. You just test it. If it needs to be adjusted, you adjust it. Sometimes you over adjust it. You gotta test it again. It's back and forth, back and forth, until you get it diving straight in the water. Additional considerations provided by Stryker Brands. Give Mother Nature the cold shoulder. And Bait Rigs Tackle, America's innovator of fine fishing products. Fishing 411 is also brought to you by Fishhawk Electronics. Featuring Fishhawk's Catch Fish Guarantee. You'll notice we use line counter reels to meter our lead lengths. If you're a troller and you're not using a line counter reel, you're really shortchanging yourself because lead length is one of the most important variables in controlling how deep lures go. So I'd highly recommend that you get good line counter reels. Uh, for over 20 years, we've been using the Okumas here. I happen to have just a, a Convector GL here. It's one of their inexpensive reels, but it's very accurate, works extremely well. This one in my hand I've had for a better part of 20 years. It's still kicking, doing just great. But line counter reels are an important part of this element. If you don't have line counter reels, there are other ways you can meter your lead length. For example, if you watch how many times the line goes back and forth across the spool as it's going out, and you count those passes, you could measure the amount of line going out per pass, and then just multiply that. Say if one pass is 10 foot and you let out 10 passes, well then that's 100 feet of line. So that's another way that you could figure out exactly how much line you're letting out. The other method is to use a metered fishing line. There are fishing lines out there that have a different color, say every 10 feet, and you just count the colors as they come off the reel. So there are other methods before, you know, besides line counter reels, but for my money, you can't beat a line counter reel for practical trolling. It's the best tool you can have for trolling. Another one of the pitfalls of trolling is that people make assumptions. They assume that because one lure looks similar to another lure, that the two lures are actually doing the same thing in the water, that they're achieving similar depths. <laughs> that does not happen at all. Every lure is unique to its own model. And little tiny things about that model determine how deep it's gonna dive. The size of its lip, the angle of the lip, the type of material the lure is made out of. Is it a balsa bait? Is it a plastic bait? Is it made out of high density foam? Uh, the size of the lure, its buoyancy, how much it might be weighted, all of these things play into how deep crankbaits go. So you can't look at two or three crankbaits that are similar and just make a, a guess as to how deep they're gonna go because there's too many variables there to identify. The only way to know how deep these things go is to do what we do, is test them, document the data, and then publish the data so fishermen can benefit from it. You know, up to this point, we've talked a lot about precision trolling, but what we haven't talked about is how folks at home can get their hands on this data. Historically, we always sold the information through a book called Precision Trolling. Many people called it the Troller's Bible. The problem with books, however, though, is that they're hard to keep current and they're hard to keep updated. So the new wave of information out there these days are apps, and that's exactly how we're marketing our data. We have two apps. We have one for the iPhone user. We have one for the Android user. Both of them are comprehensive to all our data. Say, for example, you're an iPhone guy. When you load the data, you can put it not only on your phone, but you could also put it on your tablet or your iPad as well. So it makes a lot of sense in that regard that it gets the data out to people really, really quickly. 
There is a third version, another way that you can get the information. We still print precision trolling data, but we don't do it in books, we do it in stickers. It's just a vinyl sticker that you can peel off and put right on your tackle box. They work great and they're very, very inexpensive. And down the road, don't forget, there's going to be other technology as, uh, available as well. For example, in the near future, we expect to be able to put our data on sonar units as well. So stick around and see how that all works out. But right now, if you want precision trolling data, you can get it in a sticker, you can get it in an iPhone app, or you can get it in an Android app, your choice. Hey, I'm Mark Romanek for Precision Trolling Data. I hope you've enjoyed today's program and learned a thing or two about the dynamics that influence on trolling. The variables associated with trolling are going to make or break your success on the water, and by using our data, you're going to be a better fisherman. I guarantee it. We'll hope to see you out on the water. Closed captioning is provided by Orca Coolers, built for everyday use and total abuse. Fishing 411 is brought to you by Offshore Tackle, your leader in trolling technology. Jay's Sporting Goods, trust in the tradition. Yakima Bait, home of the rooster tail. Cisco Fishing Systems, fish the finest. Northwest Ontario Tourism Association, there's no place like this. Starcraft Marine, America's oldest aluminum fishing boat line. Evan Rood Outboards, introducing the all new Evan Rood E-Tech G2, the outboard of the future, available today. Maxima Fishing Lines, the right line every time.